Isaiah chapter 25. Let's read verses 1 through 8 together. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth, for thou hast made of a city in heap, of a defense city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city, it shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, the city of the terrible nations shall fear thee, for thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. And in this mountain sh shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, of the fat things full of marrow, of wines on the leaves well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth for the Lord hath spoken it. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of the people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. The choir started us off this morning by saying, God is in control. That last verse, that last phrase, if you will, of verse 8 says, For the Lord hath spoken it. For a few moments, I'd like to share from this topic, this theme, or this subject, God gets the last word. God gets the last word. Again, I love it when you share with me and participate with me in sharing the word of God. So if you don't mind, look to your neighbor, to your left or to your right. It's a neighbor. Amen. The pastor's going to share today. God gets the last word. Look at somebody on the other side. If you're looking at the wall, just talk to yourself. Amen. Just say, neighbor. Amen. The pastor's going to share today. God gets the last word. The only problem with talking to ourselves is answering ourselves. So we got to be very careful of that. God gets the last word. Let me ask a question. How many of us know that words have power? Words have power. It's something to know that when you say something, when you say something, it has the power to impact or to have an effect on the person you are talking to. Amen. Proverbs 18 and 21 says, death and life are in the power of of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof you know when we think about the fact that words have power you tell somebody I hate you and it has a certain impact on them but when you tell somebody I love you it also has an impact on them 
their words, but their words that should be backed up with some sort of action. Some sort of letting them know that what I said is what I mean. You see, we must be very careful with our words. Because you see, when we put it out there, when we put it out there, we can't pull it back. Hmm. It is said, I just wanted that to marinate just a little bit. It is said that normally the first thing that comes out of your mouth, oh, y'all gonna be quiet on me today, is really what you felt or meant at the time. I think I might take my time today. Come on, y'all, give me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But we also, we also should know that for the sake of peace and unity, the first thing out doesn't always come out the way it was intended. There are a lot of people in our society today who would tell you, quote unquote, be straight with me. Uh huh. They may say something like, again, quote unquote, keep it real. Or sometimes in today's vernacular, keep it 100. And when we do that, when we do that, a few good men steps in. You know the part in the movie when it says you can't handle the truth. You want me to keep it real and keep it 100 and as soon as I do that, now you're telling me I hurt your feelings. I wasn't expecting that. Somebody said, if, if you don't want the answer, then don't ask no questions. Hello, somebody. I'm glad God does not, does not treat us like men and women treat us. I'm thankful today. I'm glad today that God doesn't have a problem with his words. I'm talking about the fact that when he puts it out there, he doesn't have a need to pull it back in. They went out just the way he intended his words to go out. When God says something, that's exactly what he means. Through the prophet Isaiah, he tells us in chapter 55 and verse 11, it says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void empty, useless, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You see, when God says something, that's exactly what he meant. And if you think about this verse of scripture, here's what he said. First he says, my word, meaning he's taking ownership of what he wanted to say. Because some people are like, no, I didn't say that. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. You heard it come out of their mouth. Hit your ears. Touch your understanding. And then they come out and say, but I never said that. And then you say, you need to look at Exodus chapter 20. Where it says, thou shalt not bear false witness. He said, my word. He's taking ownership of it. Still looking at 55 and 11. He says, shall not return void. It won't come back empty. There's substance into what he has said. He said, it shall accomplish. Meaning, it will do what he wanted it to do. And lastly, he says, it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. 
It lets us know that there is no failure or defeat in what God wants done. And if he wants to, he can send it to a specific person for a specific reason. If I can help the church understand something, he lets us know that he's the one who sends the pastor. In Jeremiah 3, he says, I shall give you pastors. He put it out there. There's a misunderstanding, if you will, sometime in Christendom when people may say something like, well, I voted you in. And because of that, I can vote you out. When the truth of the matter is, all they did was participate in God's plan to get the pastor in place. I'll give, give you a New Testament example of it. Jesus hanging on the cross. The people said, crucify him. Crucify him. They didn't kill him. He laid down his life. When they said crucify him, they were participating in God's plan, check this out, of salvation. Because he had to shed his blood for your sins and mine that we might have everlasting life today. So when I think about God's word, I think about how he sends it to specific people for specific reasons. I recognize and I understand that your blessing is not necessarily my blessing. Neither is my blessing necessarily your blessing. But when we're all walking in the blessings of the Lord, it's a blessing that nobody can take from us. Truly, when God says we will be or we are blessed, that's exactly what he meant. Y'all do me a favor. Do me a favor. Just lift your hands up and do this. Don't you see how blessed you are? Some people don't have hands to do this. He give us hands, we can do this. We should be doing this too. To thank him for his goodness, grace, and mercy. Because he blesses us like that. So today for a few moments, I want to talk about the fact that God gets the last word. Look at somebody and say, God get the last word. We find ourselves in Isaiah. This prophet was probably one of the most influential with respects to biblical predictions as it pertained to the coming of the Christ. God is one who does not do anything by coincidence. I mean, that's something that we should really hold on to. Because if it's happening, it's not by coincidence. It's by divine plan, will, and providence. He's allowed it for his reason and his purposes. He doesn't do anything by coincidence. And that even applies to the prophet that we're dealing with today. The name Isaiah itself means salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Salvation is of the Lord. And it indicates really the fundamental thought of his entire prophecy. A man by the name of Dr. Harry Baltima writes concerning the name of Isaiah, and I quote, he says, the word is related to the name Jesus and literally means Jehovah saves from oppression and gives deliverance. That's what Isaiah means, unquote. He further adds, and I quote again, he says, the idea of salvation is the principal one in the Bible and hence is embodied in numerous names in scripture, unquote. We find that in the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is spending time telling us about the kings in which his prophetic ministry lasted and the people in which he was called to prophesy to. In the sixth chapter, we find the call and the commission of Isaiah. He was a prophet that was given visions by God of things to come. And now in this 25th chapter, the setting of it is during the millennial reign of Christ. 
after the rapture of the church, the next big event on God's timetable, after the great tribulation and the defeat of the Antichrist. This is a period in time in which Christ has set up his kingdom on earth to rule for a thousand years without any influence from the devil. There's some application for us today, knowing that this setting is in the future, because we must understand that God is the same yesterday, and today, and forevermore. So there's three things that I'd like to look at for our consideration today. The first is found in verse number four of Isaiah 25, and there it says, for thou has been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. And Lord have mercy, haven't we been having some heat? When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. In consideration, the first thing I want to look at is found right here in verse number four, and it, and it, 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 it is, I'm sorry, it is God can handle our needs. Look at somebody and tell them God can handle our needs. You see, there are times in our lives, and truthfully, if it hasn't come yet, just keep on living because it will come, that we will need somebody bigger than us to come to our rescue. If we could handle everything on our own, there would be no need for us to call upon God. Matter of fact, we would even be in this place today because I don't need God, therefore I don't need to go to worship. Therefore I don't need to call on the name of the Lord. Well, if that's the case, maybe I am God. I met a lady when I was coming back from Africa a few years ago who told me that very statement. She says, we're all God. And I tried to be as nice about it as possible. And, and all I can do is just turn my head like, huh? <laughs> what are you talking about, Willis? And unfortunately, there are some people out there who have that mentality. So when we understand the fact that we need God, we can't do anything without God. We should indeed call upon God. As I look at verse number four, it tells us that God is faithful in handling the, the needs of those who trust in him. Because the truth of the matter is, when it looks like there's more month than money, God can handle it if we trust him. When the stresses of life appear to consume us and we're in need, God can handle that, check it out, if we trust him. You see, sometimes we're just too quick to help God out. And, and the reality is we can't help God do anything. When the storms of life keep raging and it doesn't look like the sun is ready to break through the clouds, God can handle that if we trust him. When the blast from the terrible ones, and I'm talking about the enemies who are in our lives who don't want to see us succeed, they try to take us out. God can handle that. How? If we trust him. And in these times that we're living in today, it's hard sometimes for us to trust people. Isn't that the truth? watching TV the other day had some kids riding on bikes in their neighborhood 
looked over, I looked over to Lady Perkins and I said that that's what I remember growing up. But, but unfortunately, you, can, you don't see that today because you don't know who's coming down the road in a panel van to snatch children off their bikes because we can't trust people. And the truth of the matter is the Bible doesn't teach us to trust people. It teaches us to trust God. The Bible teaches us in 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 31, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to them that trust him. Psalms number 18 and verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I'm talking about who we can trust today, y'all. Psalms number 18 and verse 30, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler to all those that trust him, to all those that trust him, to all those that trust him. He doesn't look at some people and say yes and no to all those who trust him. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Isaiah 26 and 4 says, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. If you look at that last verse, it says, trust ye, just change it to today's vernacular, trust you. You trust. Don't rely on somebody else to trust God for you. You trust in the Lord. They can't worship for you, so you might as well worship for yourself. They can't trust for you. You should trust in him. They can't lean on God for you. You lean on his everlasting arm. You see, we've got to come to terms that God is the one who can take care of our needs. We just got to trust him. Remember, remember, God gets the last word. We trust him. He gets the last word. Doctors are saying, I can't do anything else. God says, good, get out of my way. Doctors say, you only got two months left. Two years, you're still around. Because God gets the last word. Second thing I want to look at is found in verse number seven. And it says, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people. And the veil that is spread over all nations. Second point today, God will remove the covering. God will remove the covering. In this verse, the covering of the face indicated grief, sorrow, or misery. Does anyone remember that when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, they had some pictures of his wife sitting in the church for his home going service and she had this black veil over her face again it talks about grief it talks about sorrow it talks about hurt and pain to help us understand this Dr. Finnis Dakes writes and I quote he says the idea here is the removal of all satanic darkness and power now covering the whole of the nations. The prince of the power of the air that works in all sons of sin will be removed from all hearts and minds. Then men will, for the first time since Adam's innocence, be free from all satanic influence and power, unquote. When he says in verse seven, 
destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people. That, if you will, would also include all nations. So we see God, if you will, in this time is doing what I call a global thing. Because it's going to affect people globally. See, the enemy has a way of blinding or covering up our eyes. So we won't see what God has done and is doing in our lives. You know, it's almost like when something good happens, one of the first things that comes out is, but. It's like we're waiting for, what they say, the other shoe to drop. We're waiting for something bad to happen. You know, I think about the goodness of the Lord. I think about the blessings of the Lord. I leave my house, I pray. God, give me traveling grace, mercy to get to my destination. Bring me back home safely. I get in the driveway and one of the first things comes out is, thank you, Lord. Because you see, the the devil doesn't want us to think or be aware of the fact it's things like this that God is doing in our lives on a daily basis is a blessing to us. Watching the news up in Los Angeles just this week. Car barreled through an intersection. Seven people, I believe it was, died in that accident. When they left the house, I'm sure they thought they were going to be coming back home. But as a result of one person's bad driving, all of them instantly made their way into eternity. You see, we got to understand that when we see these types of things and it doesn't happen to us, it's not that we're better than anybody else. It's that we're walking in the blessings of Almighty God. I'm so thankful that in the Word, God says He'll remove the coverings. The covering of what the enemy is trying to do. The covering of what the enemy is trying to put on us. Because you see, the word of God tells us in Psalms number 146 in verse 8, it says, The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises them that are bowed down. Y'all need to hear this today. The Lord loveth the righteous. I wish I had a witness here today. He opens the eyes of the blind. When we can't see what's going on, God has a way of taking the scales off of our eyes so we can see his mighty power in our lives. Again, we're reminded in Isaiah 42 and 16, it says, and I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. Lord, have mercy. He says, I will lead them in paths that they have not known. Talking about the blind. I will make darkness light for them. We talked about the satanic darkness that's out there. He says, I'll take your darkness and turn it into light. (sighs) And crooked things. Straight. Again, when God puts it out there, that's what he means. He didn't say, I will make the crooked things straight. It says, and crooked things straight. It's almost like you heard me. He's got a way of talking to us. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. Who is he referring to? He's talking about the blind. Going back in the beginning of the passage there. I will bring the blind by the way, he says. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, the Lord says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to who? The blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. You, you do recognize that those who don't know Jesus Christ or who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are blind. They haven't seen, if you will, the salvation made available by Jesus Christ. They're walking around really hoping someone would lead them. And I'm here to tell you, God has a way of taking those blind eyes and helping them to see. The Bible teaches us that Jesus one day was approached by a man who was blind. And Jesus asked him the question, do you want to be able to see? I'm paraphrasing. Do you want your sight restored? The man said yes. It's an affirmation that he believed that Jesus could do something about his blindness. The Bible says Jesus went down, scooped up some dirt, he spat in it, and put it over the man's eyes. And soon thereafter, the man was able to see Again, let me help somebody understand some. Some of y'all sitting there going, ooh. <laughs> he spat in the dirt. You know what? If I couldn't see and Jesus was in front of me, <laughs> and he asked me, Do you want to be able to see Perkins? And I said, Yes, Lord, I do. If the Lord would just spit on my eyes, I would take it because I know that he was healing me, not my way, but his way. Thank you, Holy Ghost. At some point in time in life, y'all, we've got to stop putting conditions on God. God, I want my healing this way. I want my deliverance that way and I want this this way and I want it that way and as soon as God give it to you and it don't happen the way you wanted it now you're saying well but yeah I got it but he, he didn't do it the way I wanted him to God is not obligated to do anything the way we want him to he could have just sent us to the cross Mm. Y'all didn't want to hear that, but that's real, y'all. What they say now, that's real talk? That's real talk. He decided to save us by sending Jesus to the cross instead. I think one songwriter said, any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be blessed. The reason why we have to deal with the blind is because We've been blinded by society. We've been blinded by politics. Every two years, they tell us almost the same thing. Y'all think about it. We're going to balance the budget. We're not going to take anything from Medicare. We're going to leave Social Security alone. And depending on who you're talking to, we are going to raise or we're not going to raise taxes. It's the same story. And then two or four years later, guess what they say? We're going to balance the budget. We're going to fix Medicare. Um, they just go down the line. Because you see, politics have gotten us to the place whereby we think, okay, well maybe this person can do it. It happens when all of them agree to do it. And so as a result of that, we hear sometimes what we want to hear and not always what we need to hear. That's why I say we've been blinded by politics. And even in the house of God, we've been blinded by erroneous teachings by people who have ulterior motives. Where's my Bible study group at? We've been going through Galatians and we've been going through Corinthians and we saw all about them false teachers. 
that Paul has been proclaiming about and trying to get people to understand and hear Paul and preach to them the true and pure gospel and then these other folks coming in with these big vocabularies with these 25 letter words talking all, all flashy and dashy and as a result now the people are spellbound by their vocabulary. Here recently in Galatians, we saw that they were even talking about people who were famous and had uh, positions and influence coming into the church. And as soon as they came in, what did they do? They appointed them to positions of leadership. Never once asked, do you know who Jesus is? Never once asked, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Never once asked, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? But because they had a name, they said, well, come on in, we want you to be one of our deacons. Come on in, we, you, what you do? Oh, finance, good, we need a trustee. And these folks have ulterior motives. They don't want to do the work of the Lord, they want to do their own work. These people had even gotten to the point of really, if you will, bashing Paul for preaching the truth. And I know how Paul feels because I know what it's like to preach the truth, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And to hear people call you names because they don't agree with the truth. God has the power to help us with the blinding that society has placed on us. And all we really have to do is remember that God is the one that gets the last word. As I try to hurry to a close. Thank y'all. Third and final point is found in verse number eight. He says here, he will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. For the Lord hath spoken it. Third and final point, number three, God is our victory. God is our victory. Again, let's be mindful of the fact that the devil is crafty. He's sneaky. I like to think sometimes he operates subliminally. And my point being, some people are being used and influenced by him and they don't even realize it subliminally the devil will try anything and use anyone to bring us to a downfall he's been at it for many years he knows the tricks of the trade and with all of the experience he has some may think that we're already defeated before we even get started. My brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today. Don't buy into that lie. Look at your neighbor and tell them, don't buy into that lie. See, the reason why we cannot buy into that lie is because Jesus has already overcome the world. The Bible teaches us in John chapter 16 and verse 3, he says, I have overcome the world. And if we know him as Lord and Savior, then that tells us he's dwelling inside of us. And because he's dwelling inside of us, guess what? That makes us conquerors. Look at your name and tell him, you are a conqueror. Notice, if you will, what the text says. 
In verse number eight, he says, he will swallow up death in victory. In victory. See, a lot of people don't think death is victory. For the Christian, for the Christian, un unless the rapture takes place, death is victory for us. Because we leave this world and we enter into eternity with Jesus Christ. Here's an idea of how death is victory. You don't have no more mortgage payments. No more rent to pay. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. teaches us that we don't have any more doctor's appointments. Some people have a calendar full of appointments. I got this doctor on Monday. I got that doctor on Tuesday. I got another doctor on Wednesday. I got a foot doctor on Thursday. I got a knee doctor on Friday. I got an eye doctor on Saturday. Wait, he don't work on Saturdays. On the following Monday. No more doctor's appointment, no more sickness, no more heartache, no more sorrow. It's victory. We look at it and we're afraid because we don't know what that transition looks like. But we should look at it like as soon as I close my eyes for the very last time, the next time my eyes open up, I see Jesus. And the songwriter says, when I see Jesus, what does it say? Amen. Amen. When I see the one who died for me, the one who set me free, amen. 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 Yeah, act like y'all don't know that song. Amen. Swallow up death in victory. Again, Dr. Dakes shares something with us. And he said the word swallow means to engulf. It means to remove, abolish, cancel, and cause the ravages and triumph of death to cease. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? See, God is going to take all of that away. I mean, he's making it plain for us. Again, we're talking about this is being set during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He's telling us in advance what we can look forward to. But we know because he's so awesome in the future, he's also awesome in the present. And he can take care of our grief and our sorrow, our problems, our trials, tribulations, and trouble if we trust him. Because we're more than conquerors. In Christ Jesus. In this prophecy, the Lord gave Isaiah a vision of what's ahead in the distant future. Death again would be conquered. Even the very shadow of death would be removed forever. Dr. Dake further writes, and I quote again, he says, Christ has already conquered death. And he now holds the keys of death and Hades or hell. Unquote. You, you do know those who have keys have authority. You, you can't get into certain places unless you have keys. Amen. I'm, I'm going to be transparent with y'all. Y'all come to my house, the door locked. The door. Let me help y'all understand something. I'm from Louisiana. I got a screen door. And a screen door locked too. Amen, Lady Perkins. Amen. You know, I say, can I get a witness? I got a witness. And my whole point is this. My whole point is this. In order for, even for us, to get in the house when it's locked, we got to have keys. 
and the keys give us authority to go in. So Jesus has the keys of death, which means death can't operate unless he allows it to do so. He's got the keys of Hades or hell. That means that nothing can happen there unless he allows it to do so. You see, in God, we have victory. man by the name of Matthew Henry writes, and I quote, he says, Christ will himself in his resurrection triumph over death. Y'all just missed a shouting moment right there. Will break its bands, meaning break death's bands. Will break its bars, or break them asunder, if you will, and cast away all its cords. The grave seemed to swallow him up, but really he swallowed it up. Unquote. You see, death, Deacon Ellis, couldn't keep him down. And the grave could not hold him. Because again, we have victory in God. So in closing, my brothers and sisters, we must understand that when God says something, His words are the final words. You see, that's why we believe that the Bible is indeed the word of God. And I believe our society would be a lot better if we followed the word of God. And not only that, that we also understand that God's word is final. It is the final authority. You know, when you don't know the definition of a word, you go pull up a dictionary. We got, you know, computers and internet. We got Wikipedia. Y'all better be careful of Wikipedia. There's some folks out there changing Wikipedia. I ain't going to go there. But you go to a dictionary and the the dictionary says love is A, B, C, D, E. The Bible says God is love. And that's why we've got to follow the Bible as the final authority. If we don't know something, we'll go to law books and see what the statute is and what the precedent is. We we don't understand certain things. We we may even go through it to a thesaurus and figure out what the synonyms, homonyms, and mononyms are. I just want to see if y'all were still listening. That's all. That's all. God bless you. But my point is, we go to the dictionary, we say that's fine. And we go to the encyclopedia, once we find out, we say that's fine. And we go to the thesaurus, we say that's final. Why don't we go to the word of God and accept it as the final? I'm so thankful today, again as I hurry to a close, that God does not need to go back and fix anything about what he said. Because what he said is what he meant. And what he meant is that's what he want done. And just like when Jesus was hanging on Calvary's cross. Understand the fact that Jesus having been moved from judgment hall to judgment hall. Y'all know the story, don't you? Having been beaten to the point where his skin was wrapped, was ripped but to shreds. He was crucified on that cross on Calvary. Had been given, if you will, his mother to his friend and promised the thief on the cross eternal life because of his belief in Jesus Christ. He's on the cross and he begins to talk to the father. He says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He stated he was thirsty and when all was said and done, he said what needed to be said and that is, it is finished. 
because God gets the last word. You see, they didn't kill Jesus on the cross. He laid down his life. He said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. But I'm so glad that's not the end of the story. Because earlier on in the book of John, he said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up again. He was telling them in advance, you think you're taking me out. But actually, you are helping to lift me up. And he said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Y'all don't understand this, but when they put Jesus on Calvary's cross, they had to lift him up above the earth. And he said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. But you got to realize something. Because the grave couldn't hold him. Because death couldn't keep him. When he came out on resurrection morning, he had the last word. And the last word was all power. All power. All power in heaven and earth are in my hands. Stop listening to folk. Stop listening to people. Stop listening to their craziness. Stop listening to their foolishness. Tune your ear into Jesus. He's got a word for you today. And that word is, I get the last word. Look at your neighbor. Go ahead, look at your neighbor. Smile at him. I ain't saying it just because I'm the one preaching, but having heard a word like that, you shouldn't be mad. There should be some joy in your heart, some joy in your spirit to know that the troubles of life are here, but God is the one who gets the last word. So look at your neighbor, smile at him, and say, neighbor, I just want to remind you, God gets the last word. Now put those hands together and give God some praise in his house.